Welcome to the Wall of Soundtrack, a show where we discuss the music and soundtracks behind the very best TV shows and motion pictures. In this episode, we'll be discussing the music and soundtrack behind Ted Demi's epic crime drama film, Blow. Blow is a crime drama film that was released in 2001. The film was directed by Ted Demi, and the screenplay was written by both David McKenna and actor-writer-director Nick Cassavetes. The film is based off of Bruce Porter's 1993 nonfiction book, Blow, how a small town boy made $100 million with the Medellin cocaine cartel and lost it all. The film is a biopic and chronicles the life of drug dealer George Jung, who is a cocaine importer for Pablo Escobar's Medellin drug cartel. The movie also has a cast of renowned actors and actresses including the following, Johnny Depp as George Jung, Penelope Cruz as George's wife, Mirtha Jung, Rachel Griffiths as George's mom, Ermine Jung, Ray Liotta as George's father, Fred Jung, Paul Rubens as Derek Farrell, Jordi Moya as Diego Delgado, and Cliff Curtis as Pablo Escobar. My returning guest for this discussion is Cy Shackleford. Cy is a writer for the entertainment commentary and review website, Actionagogo. You can follow his articles on the website, www.actionagogo.com. And you can also follow him on Twitter. His Twitter handle is at Shack underscore house 83. We also have a new guest on this podcast. His name is Joey Bonskowski. Joey is a good friend of Cy, and he's also a graduate of the University of Maryland College Park. He's a fan of both TV and film, and he's also a huge New York Giants fan who loves to troll Cy for being a New England Patriots fan. We all had a blast on this episode, and we hope you enjoy it as well. Here's my discussion with Joey and Cy on the music and soundtrack behind Ted Demi's epic crime drama film, Blow. Right, Cy and jo- Cy and Joey, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me. Yeah, glad to be here today. Thanks, Andrew. So we have hey, a new. Thanks for uh, having me, guys. Yeah, 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 Joey. It's awesome to have you and finally connect. Um, so, Joey, how did how did you uh, get to know Cy? How did you connect with him? Cy and I used to ride the bus to like elementary school or middle school together. I can't remember which one it was, but we, you know, <laughs> nice. we've, we've we've known we've known each other since we were. Uh, we were we were youngsters when we were wet behind the ears. Nice, nice. So, uh, like, uh, I guess I assume you're into like, um, you know, l- lots of movies, music, and like, um, you know, comic books you as know, well. Or, <laughs> I'm I'm so I think I get all of my my comic book lore from Sai actually. <laughs> but so you know, I mean, I, and a lot of times it's usually just centered around the fact that you know I travel a lot, so I always watch movies on planes, and I'll have like a question and be like, "What was that about?" Um, but in terms of, you know, I, I think one of the things that Cy and I reconnected on actually in later in life was movies. You know, I saw he was posting a lot from the site that he works with and, you know, just kind of, you know, it was nice to engage on that front just because, you know, when it comes to, to cinema, especially certain types, I, I'm quite a geek. So it's nice to have somebody to talk to about stuff like this. Amen. Yeah, yeah, and Cy, so he he posts some pretty awesome articles on on Action at GoGo as well. I really get it get a blast out of reading those. <laughs> yeah, we got one coming up late. Uh, Go ahead, Joey. I was going to say my my favorite actually are the ones that he posts about like the true life story behind like or like the the, the story behind the comic book heroes, which is like forty seven paragraphs long, and I always find myself getting sucked in reading about some comic book person I've never heard of, nor do I care about reading this person's entire backstory. Yeah, I just, That's how you know you're, you're a true friend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I do that during the time when, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when they have, like, movies coming out, and I just want to, like, feed people, like, a little, a, not a little, but a, quite a lot of a write-up that I do on the characters' abilities, backstory, just so they know what they're getting into. So, yeah, Cy, what's new on Action at Go-Go? Like, um, we're still trying to get done done with our uh, our spy issue. We're doing like an expose on like like espionage and like movies, TV, even some concept albums as well too. Um, my my con- my contribution to that was a rating a rating and ranking order of all five of the Jason Bourne movies. Yeah, I was watching that a lot lately, and it was on HBO and and Cinemax last month a lot. 
So I watch all of them back and forth, all five of them to decide what order they go in from least to greatest. Yeah, I know well, that. And I, Sorry, go ahead, Joey. Go ahead. I was, well, was going to say, number one, that leads into, because that's where Franca Potenti got her kind of breakout U.S. role. Cool. And she's in this movie as Johnny Depp's first girl from L.A. Oh, yeah, she is. Huh. Franca Potente, yeah. So, yeah she, you know, she was, she was Born's girl. That's why we have you up here, Joey. See that? Yeah, you have a you have a good uh, good eye for for identifying actors, man. <laughs> well, I I saw that she was left off the sheet, so I was somebody who was going to have to to be the Franca advocate. <laughs> good, 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 good catch. Yeah, and that that's another film. The Bourne films just have really good music, like tons of. Uh, I have a, a, a song by Moby at the end of it. Um, All the ones that Paul Greengrass directed. Yeah, the uh, the Supremacy, Ultimatum, and the last one, Jason Bourne. Yeah, yeah. So. I gotta say though, of all those movies, the Born Legacy is super underrated. That is a quality flick. It's good, but my thing with it was why I rated the lowest on my list is because I guess I was so used to seeing Matt Damon as a title role that I grew quite attached to it. Even though Renner's a good actor, but it's like it's basically giving Jason Bourne the Jason Bourne character a brief break before they bring him back. And, uh, and I don't disagree with you, but I will say that I think of those five movies, Bourne or Jason Bourne or whatever the hell they called the last one is my bottom. Is like, your... but like is the, is my number five on that list. Like it goes one through four and then there's about 10 spaces before you get to Jason Bourne because that movie was a hot pile of garbage. It was all right though, but it was like, it wasn't as good as I thought it would be given the fact that Paul Greengrass came back and Matt Damon came I back know. too. Ultimatum was yeah, but Greengrass has had some duds because, I mean, Green Zone was a terrible movie also. Did you see United 93? I did. That's one of those movies that's hard to, like, rate as a movie, though. You know what I mean? Because, it... like, you're watching it and, like, you can't really pull out the cinematic flaws because, like, oh, my God. Like, this really I, happened. I, I don't remember, but, I mean, I do you remember, I mean, we went to, we were at Nate Dog skipping school that day. And you could see, like, his dad lived in that high rise in Bethesda, mm -hmm. and you could just see the smoke billowing from from downtown. So it's one of those things where you're like, it's so hard to watch those movies and try to like come back with some sort of like cinematic review because it's just like you know all the different like kind of cultural aspects that that plays into your life. So it's one of those things where yeah, I saw it. I only ever wanted to watch it once, and I have no interest in ever talking about it. I see your point. I see your point. And they show it a lot on Cinemax lately, too. And it's like, it's kind of, for me, call it morbid curiosity, I guess. But I wanted to see what went down, even though I know what, what is going to go down. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I feel you on it. But, like, I've seen it, too. And I just won't click on it. I won't even buy it as part of my Blu-ray collection, to tell you the truth. It's that hard to look at sometimes. <laughs> have, you, have you guys seen uh, Captain Phillips? Yes. He yeah. directed that. Yeah, that was a great movie. It was so underrated. It I mean, it's one of those things, too, where, like, you know how, like, Brad Pitt is, like, really, like, at, in his heart is a character actor, but because he's just, like, a handsome son of a bitch, he's always going to be a leading role? Yeah. Tom Hanks has become the same way, where, like, Tom Hanks can just put on, he, he's like a faceless man from Game of Thrones. He can play anybody. It's just, it's amazing what he's done. I mean, I love that movie, Sully. Sully was dope. Or, he, he, it was, it was great. With yeah. yeah, and he, I saw that. he can play anybody. He's about to play Mr. Rogers. I mean, like the guy is a complete <laughs> chameleon. And, and he's not even Crazy a handsome, and funny. He's not yeah, even a traditionally handsome fact man. About him. No, not really. But I mean, he's always had that that like a movie star appeal. Going back to when he was in The Birds, which was like his like first real movie. That's true. Well, actually, you know what? The first before that, he was in Big, which was his first leading role, I suppose. And then Dragnet. That Dan before Birds. Was it, yeah, that was before the Burbs, a year before the Burbs, 1988. Wow, man. That was, and you know the crazy fun fact about Tom Hanks is that you know he's developed diabetes from all the weight he's had to gain and lose for roles? Castaway. Yeah, that was crazy, um, the weight changes in that movie. Like, I mean, he's, I think he really makes a commitment to the role. I mean, we clearly could see that, you know, on, on screen. Oh, for sure. Yeah. He probably did, like, live on a deserted island just to get in character. Because some scenes where he was talking to the volleyball Wilson the whole time, it's like, okay, you've spent a lot of time with that volleyball, haven't you? Because what's it called? I don't think an like, actor who's just pretending can just pull that off. 
dude, I when anytime that movie's on and that scene where he loses the volleyball, I either mute it or or switch over. That 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 tugs right at the old heartstrings. Yeah, especially the Alan Silvestri score in, in the ah. backdrop in the backdrop of it. So, did you guys ever like? Did you guys ever see Blow in in the theaters, or did you just like buy it on DVD? Or? I'm I'm pretty sure I saw it in the theater. I like loved this movie when it came out, and you know, rewatching it, it's one of those things where I I don't know if it holds up as well as I would like it to, but just I remember seeing it, and I, I'm like I was thinking back when the first time I saw it. I think I saw it in the theaters. But if I didn't, I definitely had the DVD on repeat. I actually saw it in college in like one of those, um, one of those drug alcohol health health electives that they that they gave to us. So we get some credit. <laughs> that was the first time I saw it back in two thousand three, <laughs> and I loved it. I'm like, why are y'all showing us? Was I'm like, why was are y'all showing us, us this movie in this kind of class for? Yeah, it definitely. Um, college students, come on. It's not something I would I would pick to show to a health class <laughs> by any means. <laughs> me neither. Me neither. It's like showing what's it called, Passenger Fifty Seven on, on a transatlantic flight. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, this movie has a lot of great music in it. I mean, so many like classic bands, like like Leonard Skinner. I mean, it's just uh, the soundtrack is incredible, and the, the performances in the film are incredible. I mean, I think Ray Liotta should have won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for this film. Has he ever been nominated for anything at all for the Oscars? Because of all, the th- I don't even think he was nominated for Goodfellas either. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know, man. It's just. Uh, but then again, they took like decades to nominate Gary Oldman for something. So. Yeah, every, it's just a an awesome performance. I mean, just. Uh, th- I, I really think he d- he did deserve it. I mean, Johnny Depp was great too. I mean, he he definitely should have been up there for uh, best uh, best actor. Best actor, yeah, he should have been. But um, so yeah, let's jump into it, guys. Um, so right. let's go into he was, the. He, he was nominated for a Golden Globe in '87 for something wild. He's had a couple of primetime Emmy Emmy wins. He did a guest spot on ER. Uh, and this is Ray Liotta. Ball, yeah, but it doesn't look like he's ever been nominated for an Oscar. A couple of internationals, a couple of critics awards, uh, Sc- Screen Actors Guild, which I think you know means a lot to those people. He was nominated twice, All both for thing. Like, he's a member yeah, the of Rat Pack and Texas Rising. So you know nothing like the the things that kind of stand out. Although I, I think I'll go to my grave saying his best movie was Turbulence. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that's great. Um, so so first song here, Rolling Stones. Can you hear me knocking? It's played in the opening of the film credits. Um, I just again, this is I think a, a great song. Um, does have the, in the lyrics? You, there's mention of cocaine, you know, uh, and um, it really really fits in well with the theme. Uh, theme of the movie and the opening so, I'm, I think I'm going to have to be the I, I think this is where the movie went off the rails a little bit because thematically this seems like a perfect choice but I think where a lot of people initially kind of turned their noses up at this film was because of the comparisons to things like Goodfellas and some of the Scorsese work and you know Scorsese loves using him some yeah, uh, stones, yeah. so it, it, he's a stones fanatic you know he's got the documentary so i feel like people just kind of looked at it initially as being like you know off the bat they're trying to be something they're not here and i think that's why it got you know some some people pummeled it but you know again perfect choice you know i mean it's it, it really it, it opens it up right off the bat i think it's a great choice but i think this is why certain people kind of look their noses up at this movie just off the bat that, that 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 and that's like an unfair comparison too. It's like people think that because you use Rolling Stones in a movie that they're trying to like bite Scorsese. It's like the Rolling Stones are not his exclusive province in a movie. I think because like in another Johnny Depp, where he, in another Johnny Depp movie where he also plays a Boston-based drug lord. What's it called? A Black Mass. They use the Rolling Stones song "Slave" in there during a montage. And even though I think that it's kind of, I think it's an influence of Scorsese, not a not a rip of him. And that's where the critics really just lose, where the critics don't, it's a distinction the critics don't recognize. 
true enough, but I think that if it was just that, they might overlook it. It's the fact that you kind of have like the immediate voiceover, which is the hallmark of, you know, the the two, especially the two Scorsese movies, the kind of back to back Goodfellas and, and Casino, yeah. and one of them, you know, having uh, Ray Liotta in it. So I think, you know, that was why. And again, this is this is not my opinion. This is, you know, just kind of in researching it and, and reading some of the articles about it, which we can we can get into a little bit later. But it's just it's funny that that was the choice. And I I wonder if, you know, during editing when they're when they're looking at it and they're like oh this song fits this perfectly and i wonder if they knew that that was like literally the opening scene was where people were going to just decide that this is an automatic scorsese ripoff so we're you know we're not going to like it it's just it's just interesting to look back on to see if they would have made the same choices with some of the voiceovers and the music choices yeah i think i my my take on that is that i think Ted Demi, the director, uh, may he rest in peace. Is um, he's? I think he was a big. Music, yeah, I think he's a big music fan, and I know Jonathan Demi. His, um, I think his uncle, his right? Uncle, yeah. Yeah, he's done a couple of documentaries, documentary films on Neil Young. So I think he did like um, a film called Heart of Gold, uh, and which was a, a documentary on on Neil Young, and then another concert film for him. So I think I think Ted Demi's just. A huge music fan and i think he just liked the song he didn't care <laughs> he didn't care if scorsese used it or not but um and it definitely has a ton of those like drug references like it's off that album sticky fingers yeah and i think yeah. that i think the name of that album is kind of a, a reference towards drugs right and possibly cocaine because Dr drugs or thieves really too sticky fingers people that steal things or whatever yeah yeah so um Album names always fascinate me, so I'll, I'll try not to. They go don't. They don't, <laughs> they don't name them like they used to. I mean, slippery when wet, sticky fingers. I mean, these. You know what I mean? These were album names that you just don't hear anymore. They were really creative back in their drug-addled days. And the thing of it is, the album title didn't even reflect the album cover because the Rolling Stones album, "Sticky Fingers," they just show like a a, a close-up shot of a man's crotch, and you can see he dresses right to the right. If you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's like this it's like there's a lot of um Fleetwood Mac album covers that are just like that true yeah yeah agreed they they just I don't think they like invest the type of like you know creativity and effort into the the album covers anymore it's just because of all the you know iTunes and digital music now it's just like why I, I think people are just like why put why, in the effort why bother just like put something in like a different font and then like have like a monochromatic background that's all they need now yeah well, I mean, and, and not to go too far down this path, but when you used to go through like, you know, Waxy Maxies or Sam Goody or Tower Records, like a lot of times what made you kind of gravitate to certain things that you were exploring were the album covers. Because, I mean, before there were, you know, even online reviews when we were in middle school and high school. You know, I mean, like a lot of times it was word of mouth. You know, if you, were, if you didn't subscribe to Rolling Stone monthly, you know, like, how are you supposed to know what's good? So, I mean, like, a lot of times album covers were what made me want to, you know, hey, mom, can you break out the credit card for me on this? I know. <laughs> My dad used to do the same thing, like, offer me, offer to let me go through Columbia House's catalog, and he would get me whatever I want. I didn't take advantage of that until I was, like, 12. Did you guys have to do the, the bit when you were younger, when you picked the album up to show it to your mom, you had to put your thumb over the parental advisory sticker so they wouldn't no. see it? No, 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 I, no, no. I remember I had... I, no, because I had to do that with Doggy Style when my mom bought me that because that came out when we were in middle school and I really wanted it. And I remember being like, I just had my thumb on the scale the whole time. So she wouldn't see it. <laughs> yeah, and some of, some of these album like covers, like I remember Rage Against the Machine, self-titled, like that, that album cover where the... Um, the Burning Man. Yeah, the monk is like on fire. Um, you know, burn it, you know, lit himself on fire in protest. And I was just like, whoa, that like that album cover just blew my mind. Just like how it's just right in your face. <laughs> it's very like, <laughs> it's very eye catching, but, um, yeah, crazy, crazy, uh, crazy album covers. They don't do it anymore, but yeah, I think this song is, is, is perfect, man, for this, for this, for this scene. And the lyrics really match up well. Um, you know, y'all you, you got cocaine eyes, you got speed freak live, you know, or jive, sorry. Jive. <laughs> jive. Jive. Yeah. That's why I wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, uh, let's let's go to the next track. It's um The Hollywood Flames, Buzz, Buzz, Buzz. 
So it's buzz, the scene. Buzz, buzz. Yeah. Yep. The scene where um, where um, George is a young boy, and I think he's he's skating, roller skating down that hill. Yeah, he's in a in a suburban house in Weymouth, Massachusetts, working class Weymouth, Massachusetts. And from the lyrics, it's a real upbeat song about love. And given the scene where George's father's a hardworking man, but even some of his own subordinates, they give him shit. And his wife, oh my goodness, his wife just... We'll get to Perfectly his wife. Perfectly cast, by the way. And she's five years... Perfectly she, cast. And Rachel Griffiths, even though she plays Johnny Depp's mother in the film, she's only five years younger than him in real life. Yeah, that's crazy. And and I almost it almost reminded me of the young Olivia, the actress who played young young Olivia in the um, Sopranos. I know it's not the same actress, but they 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 almost like remind me of the, each other, like the way. Oh my, that is a good pull, dude. I had I don't even know if I could name who that is, but now that you me say neither, it, I'm like Jesus. Yeah, it just reminded me. I'm like excellent, excellent pull, <laughs> sir. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know it's a, it's a funny in that scene when they're playing this song. Um, it's the scene where Ray Liotta gets mad at one, have his subordinate. At, he gets mad at his subordinates, and um, are you going to play with your kid all day? We got work to do. Yeah, and he just Ray Liotta's like he just goes good fellas on that guy <laughs> like he Henry Hill. He's like he's like hey he's like I'll I'll, I'll play with my you know he's like I'll, I'll, I I want to play with my son you know. You, you know, I'll get off my back. I want to. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. And it just reminded me of like good fellows where he walks over and he, he beats up that guy who's uh trying to like um get at his wife or whatever. Yeah, look, yeah. <laughs> only only Ray Liotta doesn't pistol whip the dude in this scene. Yeah. <laughs> he just makes him this for that, you gotta buy us lunch today. Yeah. <laughs> so the one of the things that like kind of sticks with me is I'm not sure if you guys ever listened to Bill Simmons, but one of his like thing about movies that have to do with Boston is are the accents did somebody actually put effort into it like the his biggest pet peeve from the departed is the fact that jack nicholson's accent is terrible it was so, it was i mean it's not to cut you he, off a scorsese just let him get away with that he even let him wear a yankees cap during the filming of, of the movie I, I heard i heard but you know the crazy thing too is is that like it's it's like in movies like this where they're doing accents it's always in the beginning when they when they play it so like that was the one time in that movie that Ray Liotta really put it on thick. And like, same thing when, when George is, you know, looking young in the beginning when they both kind of had the, the kind of towny Boston accents going. And I don't have an ear for it. So, but that always, every time I hear somebody doing an, like a Boston accent, I'm always like, well, what's Simmons think about this? But, you know, it's just like, you know, if I want to play with my George, I'll play with my George. Yeah, and it's like, I never know, is, is, that, is, that, is that actually what they sound like or not? So I spent four years in New England surrounded by Boston people, Massachusetts all over. So everything I heard in Goodwill Hunting back when we were in high school, Joey, that's actually true in real life. Of course, and again, Goodwill oh, Hunting. Those, those guys are they're, they're from, from Boston. There, so like, yeah, they're if, all from there. If they couldn't pull it off, they, you know, they, I, I feel like they would have just been skewered if they weren't able to pull those accents off. And they still can, even though they can turn and off. They can turn those accents on and off now, like a light switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the Hollywood Flames, they were an R and B outfit, right? Back in the fifties. That's right. So like this, this was actually their signature hit, which. Um, yeah, and, and I guess, Sai, you were you were telling me, you know, before we did this, that this song kind of has a connotation with bees and yeah, it does. That's that's why I included it as part of the outline because what's it called? George, he's very trusting all throughout his life, right? He figures if he does somebody right in business, they won't fuck him over. But as we see in the film, that's not the case. He gets stung and stung horribly every time, but still gets right back in. And George, and also George's father. He suffers the he suffers the brunt of being stung by his mother. Like what's it called? If he doesn't have any money, she can't even bear for him to touch her. And that's and I know that would really sting if I was a husband as well. But these yeah, guys, yeah, it's, 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 but these guys that just keep going back to what they know, regardless of how bad they get hurt. It's that's a really interesting comment. I was going to say because like you know the fact not only do they keep going back to what they know, but they keep taking back the people that hurt them. Yes, that too. Thank which you. Is like a true like working class kind of like early you know like late sixties early seventies just kind of mentality. Yeah, and it's, it's what um it's it's what Matt Damon says to what's her face in The Departed. He was like, I'm Irish. He was like, I'll live with something being wrong my entire life. Yeah, that's that's true. That's very true. I think it's a great point too, Sai, with like how 
that he keeps, um, you know, getting hurt by the people that he's close to, but then, you know, he brings him back. I mean, his own mom, like, called the cops on him. I, I mean, mean... Oh, that scene, that scene was fucked up. Even the cop, the cop that was taking him into custody, the black cop, when, when, when what's it called, when the mother's like, I had no choice, even the cops stopped to look at her like, God damn, lady, thank you, but damn. That's yeah. What, that's, a, that's what the look on his face said to me. Yeah, the neighbor's looking, and she's like, what are you looking, looking at? Miss Your Marcy. son's no good, too. Your son's no prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Rachel Griffiths, she does a, that great Boston accent. I think she really did she, that well. And she's from Australia, and they can do, I mean, I swear. Of course she is. Australian and English and UK actors, they can do our accents better than we can. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's still one of the things that bothers me. I'll never forget just watching, like, a, a YouTube clip on, like, how many different actors – they went through for readings to play Dr. House and how when Hugh Laurie's audition tape came over, Brian Singer was like, that's what I'm talking about. I want an American. And they were like, yeah, dude, he's British. He's, he's English. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, crazy, man. Like Gary Oldman too. Like that guy can just do so many different accents. Yeah. When he played Drexel, when he played Drexel in True Romance, I, th I thought he was black initially. I was like, the way he just kept throwing the dialogue around, the way he looked, it's like, okay, okay I'm, uh, you, you, you have me convinced up until what's it called? You said you must have thought it was White Boy Day. <laughs> you must think it was White Boy Day. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> like when I saw him as Drexel, I was like, this guy's got like phenomenal range as an actor. Like, and he's not even a method actor, really. He's really just a chameleon. Because I've seen the the um, the behind the scenes interviews they gave for True Romance, and he's actually even as he's dressed up as Drexel. He's giving them in his natural British accent and and his same his same natural demeanor and personality. He's not like Christian Bale, who would actually give an interview as Patrick Bateman. That's so weird that he does that. Yeah, I know he wants to stay in character, but god damn, that's just that that's just a little bit too far. I don't know. What's his face? Daniel Day. Didn't he like take up being like a shoe smith or something for that one role he did? So I mean that guy is the ultimate. Yeah, I mean, he took up a butcher's apprenticeship for, like, Gangs of New York and didn't want to wear a winter coat during the filming of that because he thought a winter coat wouldn't exist in the 1860s. And he ended up getting sick. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> it's, going back to this, though, real quick, I actually was unfamiliar with, I mean, I remember, you know, when you watch the movie, there are times, especially more like instrumental things, that you you just kind of notice. I don't. I was not familiar with, with this tune going into it. I had to look it up. So did I. I mean, when I was watching the film, a lot of these songs I didn't know, I had to look them up and just try to figure out how the lyrics or how the song itself fits into the context of the scene. You know, not to not to go on, um, not to go, you know, out in the left field, but this one thing I did notice about this scene um, or when this song is being played, there's a few scenes, you know, where she leaves, the, the wife leaves. Um, yeah. And and she take yeah she leaves the family is the lighting the red lighting you see it like again and again you see it when you see it on his face as a like Johnny Depp's face when he's a a young a young boy just kind of staring at his mom like you know what the hell we don't want you know I don't want you back like you left us right yeah but then you see it again when he's being taken away in the police car he's looking at his mom again and there's that red light from the police car from like the 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 um the lights that are on top of the car. Yeah. And it's like illuminating his face again. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. Cause red is like symbol, symbolic of like anger. anger. Yeah. So I think it's like Ted Demi does some really cool things in this film with like, just like the lighting and, and subtle imagery. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's, I didn't even think about it. That's until now. Thank you, Andrew. But uh, I see random stuff like that. So sorry <laughs> if I go on a tangent. No, nah, it's, um, nah, it's cool. We'll go to our uh, our next song, uh, Booker. It's what Booker T and the MGs. Yeah, be my lady. Now, I don't know. I don't know much about this 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 group. Um, what's it called? If you recall, um, and when we did the Ali podcast, they had a song on there, uh, the cover of "A Change Is Gonna Come" by Sam Cooke that they did with Al Green. Oh, okay. Yeah, they more of like a, they function as more of a background band for Al Green during that song, and there was a live version too. But here, this is their own thing as well. And it's and it's an instrumental track, and it was off their albums Green Onions, and a lot of songs from Green Onions have been used in various movies, Wayne's World Two, uh, the opening iconic credit scene in Reservoir Dogs. Okay, and then this song is used when they are going to to California, right? Tuna and, and uh, George, yeah, and George. Tuna, yeah, played by Ethan Supley, who was 
in American History X, which was written by, and that film was written by the the same guy who wrote Blow, David McKenna. Yeah, and then uh, was Nick Cassavetes right? on that too, or no? and Nick Cassavetes, my bad, Nick Cassavetes him too. Yeah, and we just did that that podcast on the Wraith, right? The Wraith, yeah, <laughs> where he was the main villain, Packard Walsh. <laughs> I think you should stick to writing and directing. And directing, yeah, because the last time I saw him, he was in Entourage. And he still, apart from the fact that, apart from his hair going gray and being shorter now, he still has that whole tough guy New York image about him, even as a director. <laughs> and, and Didn't I'm, he direct The Notebook? The Notebook? I Didn't thought, he direct that? Like the biggest chick flick of all time? Wasn't that him? He might have, yeah. I know he was either I know he either directed or wrote what's called other films like Out of Time or Alpha Dog, but the notebook, yes he did. He had something he he had some direct involvement in that. Yeah, he may have gotten a writing credit, I think, for it. I'm not I don't know if he directed it though. What the, what <laughs> I'm not, I was just thinking in Entourage what Ari Gold Jeremy Piven's Ari Gold character said about Cassavetes when he was directing Vince. He said, "What's it called?" Cass- class. He said, "He's a <laughs> that he's a method actor. If the script has eat glass, they'll do it." <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but um, I yeah. missed that show. I gotta say, I know it's just like the the whitest white boy show there is, but man, did I like it. Well, Entourage. Yeah, I just that that show always carries a, a spot in my heart. Dude, that's like my cousin put me onto it back in '05. He was like, "This is the life every every guy wished they had." Yeah, pretty much. Yep, agreed. <laughs> but yeah, th- this song's played, I guess, when they when they show up in California, and then um, <laughs> you see all the girls like all the girls are checking them out, and it's like, hey, George, look, ladies, I'm like you weren't getting none of this back home, were you? Yeah, tuna, tuna being all sketchy, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> creepy. But uh, yeah, man, and then they, then we go to the next song by uh, Link Ray, which we uh, we actually covered in a previous podcast the for the Sopranos. Sopranos. The first one we did, yeah. Yeah, this is always kind of a badass song. <laughs> it has that like that, that like distorted guitar riff that really like she lets you know that something's about to go down or yeah something is going down already. And, and it works perfectly for this scene because uh, you know you know George is getting involved in some sketchy stuff, you know, drug dealing and such. <laughs> yeah, he's getting involved in the drug game. Figure it's California; they're more liberated out here, heavy into drugs. You can make a profit off of it. Because remember, he was like, "I don't want to get." He's like, I don't want to get a real job, right? Okay. Right, yeah, and he doesn't want to be broke either, ever. After after his father went had to file bankruptcy, I remember in the class I took where I first saw this film, they a lot of there was a lot of discussion. Some guy said that's what that's where he got his hustler mentality from. From right there, his father going bankrupt. No, 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 not a hustler. It just instilled in him the idea that he'd never want to be without money. Yep, yep. I think that's re- that's very true. And um, this has been in, uh, you said this was in an Independence Day. I don't remember that. It like, was the scene where uh, Randy Quaid's character, he's sitting in the bar getting drunk and all the people are just ragging him like, Russell over here, he was abducted by aliens years ago. Did they do some weird sexual stuff to you? And then the ground starts quaking. The the entire establishment starts quaking. He looks outside and he sees like a spaceship coming. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I'll have to rewatch that movie again. That's another classic. Don't see the sequel. You do not want to see that. Trust me. I start. I've, there's been like three or four times where I got like 15 minutes in, and each time I just said, "I, I, I can't do it. This yeah, is I, terrible." I, you, well, at least you didn't make the mistake of paying for it in the theater like I did. <laughs> yeah, that's time and money I can never get back. That, now, as I every every time uh, there's a new movie out that I want to see, I always text I about it. So I'm like, "Is this worth seeing?" Because, dude, I when you have a 19 month old, going to the movies is like it's such an ordeal. Like literally, like, am, like it's man. It's not just like the the fact that you're doing it, but you're like, am I? Is it going to be worth the two hours of freedom that I finally had? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I, I and it's a, it's a big it's a time and a and an investment of money too because movies aren't cheap, you know. Nah, the last thing I saw was Avengers Endgame last when was it two Fridays back at the Air and Space Museum. I mean, that was $15 right there, but it was worth it because of the I, the actual real IMAX screen and the fact that the movie started on time without any previews. Dude, the last movie I saw there was, what was the, the Dark Knight with Bane? That Dark Knight Rises? Dark Knight Rises, yeah. Yeah, my, my wife and I saw that there before we moved to New York. It was like the last thing we did in D.C. Wow. 
Yeah, I saw the 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 one before that, the Dark Knight. I saw that at the um the IMAX theater that they have in Virginia. Um, Ebar Hazy. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last movie I saw was The Mule with Clint Eastwood, and that was pretty good. That was worth it. Yeah, I think because I mean I fly for work a lot, so like they get a lot of movies new and so like that's usually one of the times i'm able to catch up and i think i just saw that that one's coming out because my wife and i are actually going to fly into italy tomorrow for a wedding so i've got about six hours to catch up on a bunch of movies both ways nice nice yeah so our next track by the band faces which i believe is a english rock band yeah they're pretty obscure yeah they're pretty obscure, yeah. Yeah, but they've got a couple of hits that you don't know about. They're like like songs that you're just like, wait a minute, you know, I definitely know that tune. And it, they, they've got a couple of sneaky songs that that because their most famous one is Ooh La La, which everybody has heard. That but was this, them. This is a band that has some sneaky good songs. That was them. I've heard that song before. Yeah. Huh. And this song is played when they're counting the money, right? Like yeah, yeah. after the, the they sell the marijuana. Yeah, after they hook up with their friend Dooley from Massachusetts from back home. They're sitting there counting the money on like the couch or whatever. And George, he's not satisfied with it at all. Just like the song is like, I'm glad, but this is this is sorry. And it's like, we're down. We're getting middled. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They know that he realized we're middlemen. We need to go straight to the source and make real money. Yeah, I think the song title just works so perfectly with that scene glad and sorry you just hit on it mm -hmm. i mean i think that's a good call out and he has his frank lucas american gangster moment because in that in that movie the denzel washington movie which came out eight years no six years after this he gets the idea of going to the source in vietnam to get his heroin instead of just being paying middleman money like buy wholesale and make the make the price whatever i want it to be yeah yeah definitely smart business that's a good Another, call out uh sneaky british actor was in that that was um do you remember the guy so when he when frank lucas brings all his brothers to new york and he brings them to the diner and he sees the guy and he walks out in the street and shoots him yeah there were two british actors in that scene one was idris yeah, elba Idr idris elba yeah and his brother and frank lucas's brother in the film the, the one that plays uh what's it, huey chew it all edge of four he's also english yeah, is he english yeah he's english 12 Years a Slave, The Martian. Yeah, and he just... Oh, no, I, I, just I, I thought, for some reason, I thought he was... American? He definitely speaks a British accent. No, but I thought he was born in, like, Nigeria. Well, his parents are Nigerian, but he was born and raised in England. Gotcha. Yeah, and then Idris Elba, he was in The Wire. Stringer Bell. He's always going to be Stringer Bell. Oh, yeah. Oh, but I mean, he is, when you talk about people who are just chameleons with their voices, I mean, the fact, it's not just that he was speaking with an American accent. He was speaking with a legitimate, like, East Baltimore accent, which is not an easy thing to do, especially I... considering there are so many Baltimore accents, because you've got, like, the, the white trash Baltimore accents. They're, you know, going to go drink some Natty Bow and see the ponies. And, take and then you've got like the the brothers and like they just that they, that show nailed it. But they, Stringer Bell, man, his voice work in that was just ridiculous. Yeah, the black folks in Boston still got that 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 white trashy accent as well too sometimes as well. But it doesn't. But with Idris Elba, he sounded more like a hood a hood American, a ghetto a black American. He didn't sound Baltimore to me. But then again, the only accent I'm familiar with from Baltimore and seeing as how all three of us are from Maryland, only accent that I think of when I think of Baltimore is the. The the exact one you mentioned, a stereotypical one. Get yourself two natty bows on your way to the O game, hon. <laughs> yeah, hon. We're going to go to the O's game. Maybe go see the ponies. Move, shitbird. <laughs> 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 so our, our next song uh, by Louis, Ar Louis Armstrong, Cool Yule. That's the uh, Christmas scene. Oh, yeah, that was funny. They got Pee Wee Herman, <laughs> Paul Rubens. <laughs> Paul Rubens. <laughs> Dude, I first of all, he he is one of the bright spots in this movie. He's really good. <laughs> Every scene he's in, he chews the scenery up. Yeah, agreed. He, when they first introduce him in the hair salon, and then he decides to meet with George and Tuna in the back, and he switches up his tone completely. It's like, okay, what are we dealing with here? Yeah, it gets all serious. <laughs> no, he's really good in this flick. Derek for real. I'm like, is that is that even your real name? Yeah, it doesn't even sound well, like a real I mean, name. He's, 
he's the one speaking of, you know, the, the buzz, buzz, buzz. He's the one that gets him probably the worst. Yes, he does. Yes, he does at the end. He, yeah. Yeah, he ends up flipping, right? Him and Dooley both end up flipping for no, lighter sentences. Diego, no, this is because Diego, when he finally gives it, when, when George and Diego go to the hotel and Diego's just breaking his balls about, you know, you take your wife to meet your source, but you won't take me. And then George gets shot by the, the two guys. And he finally, he's like, they're for real. They're fucking for real. And they go to meet him and just, they, they do that perfect freeze frame, right? When they shake hands and you're just like, oh, he's about to get, he's about to get beat out of this one. And then that's just when it happens right there, when it changed, when, when they started doing runs to, what was the name of the island? Because oh. it's at the next Christmas party when he's like, everybody's talking about this person. Who is it? And the guy tells him, he's like, no, it's an island. They're doing, they're doing multiple runs a day. What was the name of that island? I don't remember. I forget the name of it too. But it's gonna bother me. But that's not. But that's not how. What's it called? Um, that's not how Derek really stung George right then there. It's the first example. Yeah, when he, when they basically cut George out of the connect and he deals directly with Diego. But at the end of the film, when yeah. he gets busted again, that's because Derek and his friend Dooley wanted lighter prison prison sentences. Yeah, oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, I knew Dooley rolled on him. Yeah, because he had. He was like, I haven't seen Dooley in forever. I didn't realize Derek was in on that. Yeah, the George's voiceover, he mentioned Derek's name. Derek and Dooley, they wanted lighter prison sentences, but that didn't bother me. I couldn't make a promise to my daughter. That's what bothered me. I was doing some research on, on Diego's character. Apparently, it's based off of Carlos Later, like who is, um, he was one of the, the big drug kingpins back with uh, Pablo Escobar. Yeah, um, I figured Diego Luna, that was not his real name. Yeah, it was based off of Carlos later, and then there was the Ochoa family. They were like, I, I, I want to say they were involved with the Medellin cartel. Or... Yeah, the Medellin yeah. cartel are the most mm-hmm. prominent one, and they're the most prominent one in the whole movie. With even Escobar showing up, played by Cliff Curtis, who is a chameleon actor, too. Yeah, he did that a great job. That guy is unbelievable. And when he, played... he has played every nationality, every race, every religion. He is yeah, three he's kings. just ridiculous. Three Kings, Training Day, um, Die training Hard. Day. It, it, training Day, when he played the, the Mexican gangster, I thought he really was Mexican. Yeah, he was really good uh, in that movie. He was really good. But um, yeah, this song by Louis Arnold, it's, it's like kind of the quintessential Christmas song, right? One yeah. of them, yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like you, like I, it is something that kind of like you always hear. He's got a very distinctive voice too, right? Like a distinctive grovelly oh, singing yeah. voice, almost yeah. guttural, almost sure. guttural, almost yeah, yeah, guttural but melodic. And then we got uh, we got Cream, Strange Brew. I love this song because I'm a huge Eric Clapton slash Cream huge fan. Clapton fan, love Cream. Yeah, and this was all. I mean, it just fits so well because it's this like it's essentially this brew of cocaine that 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 the tester has really never seen before. Oh yeah, when they're testing the cocaine, he's like, okay, the usually the cutting agents melt away melt away around such and such, and the coke melts away around here. Okay, it's still still going. A hundred and seven. 160 fuck me running 170 <laughs> yeah and it's bobcat what's it bobcat gold uh, that, that was bob goldsway yeah yeah what every time i think of bob goldsway i think of either police academy or scrooged i don't think of nothing else after that really because he hasn't been seen that much yeah he makes like a random appearance there and i was like whoa that like it, it's like a skinny mm-hmm. uh, it's like a skinny but he's like so skinny his face and then he's like I can't feel my, my face. face. <laughs> like you want to buy try yeah, let's, let's all do a line. Fuck it. Yeah, but this this was just uh, epic, including cream. And we we've heard it. I think in um in the Sopranos too, they used a couple of uh, they used a couple of cream songs. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of them oh, was the, the Sopranos was known for doing classic rock. I mean, David Chase. Yeah, was I mean, he, you know, I mean, the, him, Terrence Winter, you know, Scorsese kind of had a piece of like in the production in the back of this. And those guys, I mean, the music that they do, we were talking about this earlier, how they kind of overlaid it with the Sopranos on the previous song. They, the music choices in that were one of the reasons why that still is just like the gold standard of like the golden age of television. Very much so, yeah. And it's like, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought already about that. With with the lyrics, though, I mean, if you look at the lyrics of this song, um, you know, it says with you now, what are you going to do? Strange brew, kill what's inside of you. It's almost like a playoff of how potent the 
cocaine is like it could kill you it's so strong it could kill you somehow he couldn't feel his face and before that they wasn't even talking about any kind of cocaine like that yeah so again another another great <laughs> inclusion and, there and it's an example of how they basically create the market for cocaine in the united states with this new potent south american median cartel cocaine it's a strange brew and what's it going to do to all of you yeah politicians famous people celebrities even even creeping up in middle class white suburbia it, it's a strange brew for everybody yeah and um you know we go to our next one which i think is one of the the highlights of this soundtrack my one of my favorites by uh ram jam and uh it's uh black betty Oh yeah, that scene, that scene where they get rid of all the coke, him and Derek. Yeah, that that scene, that was a good song to use in that scene. It's just epic, man. It's so epic and it's been used in a bunch of TV shows like Eastbound and Down has used it. <laughs> <laughs> Danny McBride. Kenny Powers. Kenny Powers. <laughs> when he's on his jet ski, <laughs> he throws the girl off the jet ski <laughs> in the back. <laughs> it's so funny, man. Oh my goodness! I'm a Marilyn Manson. I'm also a fan. This this is one of those songs where you're just like, anytime it's on, there's always something good happening to the people on the screen. You yeah, know what I mean, yeah. like it's one of those things where, like, even if it's there's negative undertones about what's going to happen. I didn't really ever watch *East Bound and Down*, so I can't speak to that. But this is just always on in that scenario where, like, you know, they, they've hit it big. They just had a big score. You know, they're getting yeah. after it. Like, this is that perfect, even perfect if, track for even that if, type of. Even if it's a completely illicit, yeah, like you said, something, it always plays when something good's happening. And they just got rid of 110 pounds of cocaine in just 36 hours. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, it's just and insane. Because it, it also it bleeds into when he gets met at the airport, meeting the guys when he's going down to Columbia for the first time. Yeah, yeah, he does. Who transport him to meet Pablo Escobar. It's like, that's not someone you say no to. Yeah. What I think is really cool about this song and the editing is like when you see – Johnny Depp walking with the suitcase, his stride like matches up with the beat, yeah, like in the song. He's got the, the swagger going on. They're in sync with each other. Yeah, it's really cool. That's really cool the way they did that in the editing. And like, also, what's it called about the song? The background of it, like Ram, Ram Jam. They're the they're the band that played like a hard rock New York City band, and it's actually a remake of a folk song from the 1930s about blue collar African Americans. And because Ram Jam, they're a white band performing it, back in the day, the civil rights groups like the NAACP and the um, the Coalition for Racial Equality, they tried to get the song boycotted be simply because it was being played by a white band. But And ironically, ironically, this, the title of the song, Black Betty, it's really ironic that they use I think this was deliberate because one of the slang terms for cocaine, the drug, about, the drug in, about the, in question, is white girl. Black Betty, white girl. Yeah, the, the um, <laughs> yeah, and then the, I mean, when you think about it, like this, uh, how good this song is, and then they transition to the 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 man Manfred's Man Earth band, you know, Blinded by the Light. Oh yeah, when they make the deal with Escobar, and what yeah. happens after that, it's like, my goodness, they are. So, do you guys want to know who has the the writing credit on that song now? Who? Oh. That's Bruce Springsteen wrote that song. It was a cover. It, it was so, a co cover of a Springsteen song. Yeah. But yeah, he gets so, the credit I mean, for yeah. it. That's pretty crazy. I mean, the, the, the Springsteen version is completely different. I mean, like the one thing I've heard it. that, you know, I've, you heard about this and it's like, they, you know, that might be my song, but they made it their own. Because, I mean, that the way they do the hook on that song is just fantastic. It's also one of the like most quotably wrong lyrics in, of all time. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Like I said, I and thought everybody knows "Blinded by the Light." Nobody knows what comes next. Revved up like a deuce, another runner in the night. Yep. And I always thought it was "Roll up like a douche in the middle of the night." That's what I thought it was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and Springsteen, he still gets since he's he is credited as a writer for the song. He still gets royalties off the song whenever it's played too. It's it's not even credited as a writer. I mean, it's his song. Well, yeah, it is. It is, but he still gets paid off it, no matter what, even if it's a cover version. That's what that's what I'm saying. Oh, for sure, I'm agreeing with you. But it's one of those things where, like, you know, like Adele, for example, like example, like she wrote a bunch of songs for people before she started singing. You have a lot of people that like wrote songs for other people. This yeah. was a song that you know, I mean, Springsteen wasn't the type of guy that just like wrote songs for other artists. 
this was his jam. I mean, this wasn't like Jimmy Iovine working with Stevie Nicks in a basement someplace and then just, you know, passing out songs. Like, this was his song. He performed it. It's off of, I can't remember what album it's off of, but I mean, like, this was his jam and somebody else took it and made it their own. I think it's like Stairway to, or, um, oh God, what's the, the really famous Hendrix cover of the Bob Dylan song? All, all Along the Watchtower. <laughs> All Along the Watchtower, which my favorite version of that is by Dave Matthews, but we don't have to go, have to go down that particular uh, 90s but, nostalgia right now. But, but it, I mean, like, this is it, one of those things where it's his tune, you know, you know what I mean? It's his tune, yeah, but somebody else just took it and made it more popular. Yeah, yeah, and and um, the thing that's crazy about that song, it's like the, the editing is done so well in in Blow, where, like, I love it when, when Still, Diego screams and you hear like his echo, echo. like you the echo of his scream. Yeah, yeah. And a still and a still it's frame perfect. montage that they keep going through, like how they opened the market for cocaine in the country and they became mo- millionaires overnight. Yeah, and and it works so well if, with the if lyrics. You snorted right, cocaine like, in the late seventies or the early eighties. It's possible that it's most likely that it came from us. <laughs> Very yeah. likely. Yeah, he's like, we dropped, or we dropped cocaine like an atomic bomb. What was that? Like? <laughs> we, we dropped it on the U.S. like an atomic oh. bomb. It started in Hollywood and moved east. Everybody was doing it. I mean, everyone. We invented the marketplace. And it goes well with the lyrics, like blinded by the light. It's almost like when an atomic bomb goes off, you hit that real like bright flash, you know. And, pe- and when they're testing it, when you, you watch like the videos, like the government videos where they're testing it, like, you, they have to wear these Shades, goggles. Yeah, because yeah, it's so it's so bright. So I just think it works really or well. If you're Arnold, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger in True Lies, you could just cover your eyes with your hands. No big deal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, man. So then we go to our next song by Casey and the Sunshine Band. Keep it, keep it coming, love. So this one is played. Keep it coming, love. Keep it coming, love. <laughs> and that's played uh what in the, in the at the party at the or, wedding right or, the new year's eve party where george learned that right. Diego new year's eve party. stole stole his connect stole Derek right from under him yeah and and i definitely think this is another one that's well well played um well played and well placed in this movie and um you know you look at the lyrics right like don't let your well run dry don't stop it now don't don't give me no reasons why don't stop it now I mean, essentially, I mean, I, I just think it really it works well with the theme of the scene, right? And he's yeah. getting like, essentially getting fucked he's over, getting right? He's getting shafted. Business-wise, he's getting shafted, but he's taking it personally. Yeah. It's like, don't stop it now. Don't let the train stop because of that. <laughs> and then, then it, and then it, you know, it segues into that next scene where, where, where um, what's it? Uh, George goes to the island, right? Like he ends up like ends confronting, up confronting Diego. Diego. Yeah. yeah. And Diego just admits it, just brazenly admits it, and has all of his dudes just fuck up George. Yeah, and then it's the guy like Cesar that yeah, he like stole he stole, the, stole his wife from. Yeah, his uh, fiance Penel- from Penelope Cruz. Yeah, that dude never liked George in the first place. When they were trying to do the smuggling thing, he's like, "I want to know more. What about the suitcases, the false bombs?" He's like, "What the fuck is this, Diego? What the fuck is this guy?" <laughs> And he's like, he, he like, like it gets real when he asks the pilot for like pictures of his kids. Like yeah. that's when it, I was like, yeah, this is like, this is real. This is like, yeah, they're going after your kids if you fuck up. Yeah. Like you don't last long in this business if you make a mistake, right? Like they you either bet- take you out or. Hey, you're better off not having no attachments really. Yeah. And it always makes me think, I always wonder if that pilot was like one of the, the, the famous pilots, like smugglers, like Barry, Barry Seal. Did- like an American made with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Like I'm sure it was based off of somebody that was like the real dude, like yeah, our famous. Probably, yeah, they didn't give the real name for it, of course. Yeah, and they, I don't know if you guys have you guys seen Cocaine Cowboys, the documentary. I have. Oh yeah, dude, it's awesome. It's legit. It's so good. It is. It is that in Narcos seasons one and two. Mickey Monday. That's what well, it kind of. <laughs> Mickey Monday with I the. Uh, Nar- Narcos is a wonder. I mean, like the storytelling behind that. That is just like. So the historical fiction aspect of it where you know they took liberties but they were much more kind of true to unlike a blow where they didn't really talk about the ochoas and you know the other people that were going around like the, the, the hyper focus on like trying to keep it a, a real story and using like the characters from it which is why pedro pascal's character actually left the show because he wasn't really involved and then you know when they did this new you know um 
Narcos Mexico, you know, there was a lot of talk about trying to bring him back into it because his character is just so good, but they wanted to stay true to form. It's a little bit like, I'm not sure if you guys ever watched Deadwood, but I mean, the reason why the show stopped initially was because they ran out of source material. Yeah, that was written by and David just, Milch, right? David Milch. Yes, it was. And the movie's coming the back. Movie, yeah. So it's timely. Nice. Yeah. I, so do you think the movie's going to be good? Because a lot of these movies that are based off of the, you know, TV shows are. They're kind of iffy. People get, you know, they so don't the get very good that they reviews. got the same cast, the same writer, director, you know what I mean? Like they, long, every, everybody's in it from like the crazy Chinese guy to... As long as they throw a uh, cocksucker in there, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Swanjin. Swanjin. <laughs> love, love that show. Yeah, I heard good things. And David Milch is an incredible writer. He did Luck, too. I think he was writing that with Michael Mann, which only, unfortunately, went for one season, but... Um, I love that. I have that on DVD and it's like the first season was awesome. So check it out if you ever, uh, get a chance, but, um, yeah, let's go to the next song. Uh, Leonard Skinner, that smell, another classic, right? Everybody's heard that one. Yes. Yes. On the jute box or. Yeah. Especially when you go down South and like maybe make a pit stop at a trucker stop or whatever. Yeah. You hear it there. Yeah. I, and I actually saw them live like, uh, you know, a few months ago or um, last summer, actually, um, actually, you know, of course it wasn't all of the original members, but, um, it was just kind of cool to see, uh, to see that song played again. And, um, you know, this definitely fits so well with this scene is when George is, uh, I guess he's trying to get ready before <laughs> his wife delivers the, delivers the, the baby, baby and he's all coked up out of his mind. Like, <laughs> coked up on alcohol and he's right there in the delivery room when she gives birth and he collapses of a heart attack right then and there yeah and like he was like looking for his keys and he opens up the bag and there's like all this <laughs> coke in there like yeah. it's like dude it's like oh god you're supposed to be out of the game at that point too and it goes like the 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 song goes so well with the scene because the lyrics are like there's too much coke too much smoke you know look of what's going on inside you and i mean we're, we're essentially in this scene looking on looking at what's going on with george and he's just kind of falling apart and when, and when Ronnie Van Zant, when he wrote this song, it was about like the all the excess that comes with fame and money, like the drug, including the drugs and the alcohol. But even too much of something can kill you, and hence that smell, the smell of death, whatever you want to call it. And I love the narration when he's in when he's in the the uh, the OR, you know, with the uh, and his wife is delivering. He's like, "This was the greatest moment of my life, or feeling in my life, followed by the worst I'm feeling, feeling in my life." life. Yeah. <laughs> He's like all twitching there, like you know. He just collapses right then and there. They said it was acute cocaine toxicity. Yeah, I like, just. He's like, I guess I had. And he kind of says, like, you know, he says it really dry. He's like, I guess I had a high tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a that's another great one. And then we'll go next to the Marshall Tucker Band, which is this song is pretty classic. Can't you see? I've always heard, I've always seen the live version on YouTube. That's like the most well known version. And I had to rip it and put it on my iPod too because compared to the studio version, I'm like, nah, nah, this live version, it's, it sounds better. Yeah, I don't know much about the Marshall Tucker band. They're like a, are they like a blues rock? Blues rock, like the Heartland country rock that was big that started in the 70s and ended up having like a pop sound in the 80s with guys like John Kruger Mellencamp. Yeah, and I think this song just like the, the, the guitar and everything like it's just kind of a warm sound and i think it fits really well with like the scenes you know the montage of when his daughter's growing up and it was originally written as a pretty dark song but like an upbeat sound to it really i mean a man struggling to get away from who he is and like who he's hurt and trying to make, make himself better atonement yeah yeah so um i definitely think that's a good that's a good one and, and uh, for the f and it's used in the montage of like him after the birth of his daughter christina and the five years, the first five years of her life, which from the looks of the film and the montage they show, it's like, it looks like George is doing good. He's happy. He's clean. And then that birthday party, his 38th birthday party happens. Yeah, where Penelope Cruz, like his wife, just goes nuts. Like, uh, uh, what do you call it? A cocaine buffet. That's what he called it at the party. <laughs> it, it takes a lot to make Penelope Cruz look terrible, but I got to say. They did a great job at the end when they put all the weight on George and they had her with the short hair and the track suit smoking like Virginia Slim cigarettes, just looking being crazy. Looking like, skinny with her head all big and whatnot. And she had that awful, like, like, like that awful dyed hair, that yeah. blonde hair. I was like, yeah. nah, no, they, they don't work for it. you. 
It's as like a, Sharon Stone at the end of Casino. Like it, it's just like I. It's difficult to portray crazy very well. <laughs> it's like hard to write. But like I feel like these these two are like the best versions of like crazy written is literally the way Sharon Stone portrayed Ace's wife in Casino and how she flips out on him in this movie. Like it's just insane to she, watch. It's one of those things where you're like, how do you like? Is it one of those things where like somebody is able? It's so hard to get inside, like, when you're having just, like, a blow-up crazy argument and actually, like, put that on paper. You have to wonder, like, how many scenes they did where they just, like, get yourself all riled up and you start screaming like a crazy person because a lot of times you can see that it's, like, contrived. It doesn't feel real. But, like, this has that feeling of, like, you could see, like, her seething contempt for him. She was doing this. She probably did some coke to get in character. (laughs) Okay. Sharon Stone. Also, by the way, she played she played the journalist that Escobar had the affair with in that terrible movie that her and her husband Javier Bardem did together recently, which I can't even remember the name. Every every Escobar biopic has always been terrible, but you know they gave it the the, the best try. Yeah, only Narcos. Narcos pulled it off, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, I I, I think I think you know you mentioned Sharon Stone. That that scene where they're screaming at each other on the lawn in front of the police. Oh yeah, she tries to. She keeps ramming she's her throwing, car. She's throwing like like leaves, leaves at him. him. <laughs> and just a look on his face. It looked like he had like like he just like like some lemons just got in his eye or whatever. It's like you want to do something about this? Huh? He's, he's still sitting there in his pink robe, smoking his cigarette with a cigarette holder. Like, don't you threaten me? Don't you threaten me? And she's got that haircut, man. Oh my god! And that gold, like shiny bad boy puffy shiny suit or whatever that she has on. Oh yeah, the, it's another tracksuit. You know, yeah, tracksuit. Yeah. You put a woman in a tracksuit with like, with terribly short dyed hair, which is crazy. Comes flying off the screen. <laughs> That's what got her the Oscar nod right there. That whole scene right there. <laughs> By and the, the way, the fact that she didn't win was a travesty. And then De Niro gave hints to his comedy career there. He's like sitting there, you know, looking at her like, are you going to do something about this? And it reminded me of Meet the Parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's good in comedy. De Niro is good in comedy. It analyzed this, man. Right? Midnight, like, midnight Run. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a phenomenal actor, but... um. Yeah, so I guess we're we're coming up on the last song, right? Like by Nikki Co- Nikki Costa, push and pull. Yeah, it was using the ending credits of Blow. Yeah, yeah, and I was uh, I I didn't like realize it. Like I I I had to, you know, I told you I was watching it on Prime and actually call out the songs, but uh, that that one kind of sneaked by me initially. And uh, me too, because largely because it wasn't using any particular scene in the film, just the ending credits, which which are just the ending credits for me, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I don't know too much about this artist, though. I mean, I guess she um... she had a song when I was in college, early college or late high school, "Like a Feather." The, yeah. she, she had that song come out, and she had a bunch of songs, and she had one song that was used heavily in like some Tommy Hilfiger commercials back then. Gotcha. Okay, but uh, I guess that was the... back in the heyday of like the Gap commercials uh-huh. and the Tommy Hilfiger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the title "Push and Pull." That fits real well, I feel like, with the ending of the, the really the ending of the movie, which is, I mean, geez, it's heart wrenching, right? Like, it is heart wrenching. It's a bookend towards the beginning of the film because it, it provides closure to what we saw at the beginning with him. It's like, this is pure uh, Colombian cocaine. Yeah, disco shit, right? Yeah, disco shit. And it's back to the scene and we realize these people just betrayed, they, they just rolled on him. Yeah. And he had a promise to his daughter, too. It's like, oh, that makes it even worse. And his daughter was already in the process of forgiving him. After all the lies that her mother put into putting her head in the years that he was away in jail. Yeah, and I think this what this that scene, the ending scene where like he's having that flat or having that um, hallucination. Yeah, where his daughter's there. I mean, oh my, geez, you know, it's yeah. like it's just heart wrenching, but it's it what it's what makes the movie so powerful. And you knew it was a hallucination because they're nowhere going to let a civilian on the yard like that to visit a prisoner like that at all. Yeah. And that, and that's why I kind of think I'm like the film doesn't get enough credit that it deserves because of that scene. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a very well acted drama. I think, yeah. I mean, people knock it like Joey said earlier in this episode that for being a Scorsese rip or trying to be a Scorsese rip, but it stands on its own. Yeah, I don't even think of, I don't even think of Scorsese when I look at this film, even with the Rolling Stone songs they they use in the opening. Yeah, and I mean, it's just... I think 
the measure of movies like this, I think the biggest one is, is it rewatchable? And that, I think, speaks to it. It's just the brilliance of the movie because any time this movie is on, I will watch it. Whether it's, you know, 10 minutes in, you're like, oh, here comes that scene. I'm just going to stick with it and end up going until the end. Or if even it's at the end, it's one of those movies where I can rewatch it over and over. And, you know, if you'll flick into like TNT and you see that it's on, you'll be upset because you're like, oh, man, I want to watch this unedited with no commercials. It's right. one of those movies where you can just get back into it. You know, we were kind of talking about like United 93 earlier, just like my desire to never want to rewatch something like that. But, you know, there are a lot of movies that you like at the time and then you kind of come back to it. and You're like, oh, this doesn't really hold up. But this is one of those movies where I can watch over and over again. I mean, the performances are really good. I do think that, you know, Penelope Cruz is a phenomenal actor and she it's one of those i mean she was nominated for like a razzie like for three three movies in a row because she's one of those actresses that really is just i mean she won an, an, an academy award for a spanish language movie vicky christina barcelona she, she's i mean she's just phenomenal but you know they tried to put her in some of these roles and i don't know if the chemistry that she has in other movies comes off as well, just because, you know, the, it's, you can tell it's, it's not the language. It's difficult for, for her to bring kind of the passion behind the script. But I actually think of all the people in the movie, she was the worst, which is unfortunate because, like, it's such a cool dynamic between the two of them, just like how they started, you know, the crazy in love. And what they but, became. You know, yeah, and, you know, but other than that, I just, I, I look back on this movie and just think, you know, this is a quality flick. You're right. It bookends, you kind of like know off the bat, like that opening scene, like something, something's up here. And, and just the story of it is really, really powerful. And Johnny Depp, this was, you know, I think this was before he really hit the shits when he, you know, just because that guy can't make a movie right now to get out of his own way. But for the most part, I mean, this, this really holds up for me. I, I I agree. Well said. Well said. And also, when you mentioned movies that you could watch over again, regardless of where they start at on cable, Casino is like that. Because every time it's on premium channels, no matter what I'm doing right then and there, if I see it's on, it's like, oh, never mind. It's, it, whether it's the beginning of the movie, which also like Blow, also has the same bookend, the car exploding and whatnot. Yeah. Or whether it's in the middle of the film where James Woods is cursing out Sharon Stone's kid, I'll still watch. I'll still watch right then and there, regardless. Yeah, you know what's kind of interesting? I don't know if you guys noticed this, but in the scene where um, I believe he's talking, like the, the George's lawyer is talking to him and he's playing the tape of his dad or, oh, or, yeah. he's, or he's like playing, I'm recording sorry, he's recording the tape uh, that he's you know going to send to his dad. Um, that's actually the director of the film, Ted Demi. Like, that was Ted Demi right there? Yeah, the he, make, he makes a cameo there. That's a Hitchcock, Hitchcockian shit that he did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of tragic because he ended up actually, I believe, dying of like a a cocaine overdose during a celebrity basketball game, like a few years later, two years later, in fact. Yeah, which is it's crazy because, and it's tragic because I feel like he had a lot of potential. I mean, this film was incredible. I mean, I just wonder what else the guy he could have done. Yeah. Yeah, the reach, you know, he could have had, and then his uncle died like almost fifteen years later. Uh, jo Jonathan Demi. Oh, he's oh he, he passed away. He's dead, yeah. Oh, jeez, yeah. But he had some really good films too, like you know, Silence of the Lambs, like Philadelphia. Philadelphia, Philadelphia yeah. Philadelphia is a phenomenal movie. Yeah, they use that. I remember yeah, yeah. they they use that film in cross cultural communication. Hanks, yeah, yeah, he and Tom Hanks won back to back Oscars for that, and then Forrest Gump next year. Yeah, it's just. Uh, but I mean, um, I thought that was um, I thought Bobby Zemeckis did Forrest Gump. He did, but I'm saying Tom Hanks. He won Best Actor back to oh, back. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, Robert Zemeckis. Uh, he's awesome. Flight. That was his, that was one of his best movies, even though it was a product placement for every alcohol brand in the in the world ever made. That movie, Denzel Washington. Yeah. Has he gets screwed because he was up against Flight, Daniel Day Lewis. That was that was a, that year he went up against Daniel Day. Yeah. The next year for Fences, he went up against Casey Affleck, who. That performance of his was, I mean, you know, people get rewarded for these kind of like gut wrenching performances. And like, you know, I feel like it was probably deserved, but he definitely is the type of guy that you look at and you think he should be carrying around six or seven best actor, best actor knobs because what he wanted for in training day, mm -hmm. I mean, 
it, that was like that, that's just the academy making up for shit like they always do like giving it to scorsese for the departed and that's probably like his fifth or sixth best movie that's been nominated i mean they he's always had, he's had, to happen he's had better films in the departed that he should have got oscar nominated for and won something for goodfellas notwithstanding yeah Agreed. Um, Goodfellas, Casino, Raging Bull, Kings of New York. I mean, all these movies that just kind of get overlooked. And then you even have somebody like Glenn Close in this past one. Did you say just King of like New York? Did you say King of New York? What did I say? What did I say? Did you just say King of New York for Scorsese? I think you meant I think gangs. I might have botched that. Oh, ga- I think gangs of New York. Gangs of New York, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I must, <laughs> we'll I must, have, you. I must have misheard you. I must have misheard you. That's why I No, asked. I think you're I think I, I think I botched it. <laughs> King of New York, that's Abel Ferrara. <laughs> but uh yeah man the uh i feel like i feel like there there could have been more you know potentially great stuff coming from from ted demi and it's uh i think did you guys see also on the credits that dennis leary was a was a producer on this film i did see that yes i did not <laughs> i didn't yeah dennis leary was a was a uh, executive producer on this film and it made sense when I kind of connected the dots because Ted Demi did a lot of stuff. Uh, he, he had done a lot of like, you remember those little one, like like 30 second video rants on MTV from Dennis Leary? I remember those, yeah, he, back he would, in the 90s, yeah. Yeah, he filmed those. And then uh, I think he actually directed a film with Dennis Leary called The Ref, which is pretty funny. Like, <laughs> it's actually it's pretty Scorsese. funny. That was Scorsese. That was uh, Kevin Spacey. Was it that? And was that, was that Kevin rest. Spacey and Annette Benning? Yeah. And they were, it was like a, a divorcing couple in New Jersey that he's house he broke into. Yeah. Almost like American Beauty. Which they were both in. <laughs> which they were both in. Yeah. Which like, that was um, Sam Mendes, right? Who Sam Mendes directed, directed that one, yeah. That's probably like what his best yeah. film. Like now he's doing the Bond movies, mm-hmm. which are actually pretty you know, He's doing a really good job with those. Uh, yeah, they could well, do... so he got bumped, and they tried to give it to um, was it Danny Boyle? They he could... tried to make it, was it... and could... then he got fired from the most recent one what for did... Bond Twenty Five. What did Danny Boyle do? I'm trying to remember like what he's really well known for. He, he did like Acid Street and Train Spotting. Train Spotting, yeah, okay, he did that. Was he one of? Was he did? Did he do one of the Boondock Saints or no? That was what's it called? Uh, Duffy. Yeah, and that's the only thing he's ever done, by the way. <laughs> like yeah. he just, like, it's yeah. No, so he actually did some like some more mainstream because he did Steve Jobs. He took over for God. I think was it supposed to be Fincher that was supposed to do that? I thought or, I thought it was Fincher based on how it looked during the whole uh, like the Sony hack that when that whole thing went down. But I mean, like he did, you know, he did Boyle did Twenty Eight Days Later, Train Spotting. Um, you know, he directed the the big part of the uh, the London Olympics. They made a big deal out of that when they had like the Queen jump out of an airplane. He did Slumdog Millionaire. He did that movie with um, the guy who cuts off his arm when he gets stuck in the mountain. Oh yeah, with James Franco. Yeah, I mean, the climber. Had, the climber. Yeah. That, yeah. That's not the name of the movie, but it was like that famous climber who got caught. Yeah, in like a crevice or yeah. something. But yeah. um. Yeah, well, guys, this is this was awesome. I really enjoyed doing this. Um, this is a great movie, great soundtrack, and um, Joey, thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm glad we got a chance oh, to man, connect. I'm, I'm honored to be the uh, the first guest. And we should have you back again because you really added a lot to this, and we appreciate it. It adds more to the discussion. Well, my friends, it was uh, it was definitely my pleasure. All right, man. We'll take it easy. Indeed. All right, fellas. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, bro. This podcast is available on my YouTube channel, Rotunes Reviews. It's also available on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and other major podcast distributors as well. So if you don't mind, please leave me some feedback. I'd really appreciate that. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter. My Twitter handle is at RoadTunesRevs. I'm on Instagram, and I'm also on the Untapped app. My username is BrewTuned. This is Andrew signing off. Cheers.
If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel and follow Roadtunes Reviews on Blogger, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And as always, thank you so much for your support.